All right, so this is going to be an AP Physics C review of a bunch of circuit topics like current, voltage, resistance, resistivity, power, and Kirchhoff's rules, or Kirchhoff's rules. I'm never sure how to say that. So the, the most basic quantity in all of electric physics is just charge. And charge we represent with Fibu check Q. <laughs> The Q is the letter we use to represent charge. Now, if you have moving charge, that's what we call a current. So if charge starts moving, we have a current, and current we represent with an I. Why there's no I in current, I really don't know. Why'd we use I? Because H was taken. No, it really wasn't. I don't know why we used I. I is the amount of charge that flows per time now this is AP Physics C, so we don't have to use this algebraic definition. We can use a differential calculus definition and call this dQ dt. And you might be like, what does that mean, dQ dt? So imagine you have a wire. Um, so there's a wire here. Let's make this go straight. Straight wire, you've got some current flowing through it. That is to say, let's say there's a bunch of I know positives aren't the ones that move, but just let's say there's a bunch of positives flowing this way through the wire. So what you have to imagine, to imagine what current means is pick some point like right here and imagine an, an imaginary gate, an invisible gate that these charges are gonna flow past. You're just gonna sit here and watch and you're gonna count how much charge, this is an eyeball, how much charge flows past this gate in a given amount of time. So algebraically, you could be like, well, let's wait 10 minutes, count up all the charge that flowed through in 10 minutes, divide by 10 minutes, you'd wanna put it in seconds, so like 600 seconds, and that's how you can get the current. But, uh, you know, what if it changed during that 10 minutes? You'd just be getting an average value. If you wanna get an instantaneous value of current, that's why you'd wanna use this calculus definition, you could say this. Uh, wait for an infinitesimally small amount of time. So allow this time you wait to be infinitesimally small. You might be like, but if I wait an infinitesimally small amount of time, that means an infinitesimally small amount of charge is going to pass through here. Basically none. And in calculus, basically none means dq. <laughs> so it's true. If you wait an infinitesimally small amount of time, an infinitesimally small amount of charge will flow through, but if you take the ratio of that infinitesimally small amount of charge divided by that infinitesimally small amount of time that passed through this imaginary gate, you would get the current at that moment. That'd be the instantaneous current. Now, if your current's constant, it doesn't matter. You use either one of these, you get the same number. So why would current choose to start moving at all? Uh, for all practical purposes, the reason current starts to flow in our world is because of a voltage, a difference in electric potential. So if you've got some voltage set up, I mean, that's how we make it happen. Are there other ways to make it happen? Yes, but for now, the easiest way to talk about it is just assuming voltages are the things that cause current to flow. You can think of these as a change in height. Um, so if you just have a wire you know, there's just charges here and the electric potential is the same everywhere. Charges will always try to seek out lower electric potential. So if you tell me there's positives flowing to the right, I know there's a lower potential energy over this way because that's what things in the universe do, not just charges, masses, positive charges, negative charges, quarks. They all seek out lower potential energy. So if they're flowing to the right, I've got lower potential energy over there. But if you've got no voltage set up, then you know, the electric potential energy is the same everywhere. These charges have no reason to flow one way or the other. So set up a voltage, that means set up a battery. So batteries are the things that we use to set up a voltage. So if you set up this battery and you connect some wire to it, and they're good, there's probably gonna be something in your circuit that it's going through, we'll call that a resistor. This thing is gonna be stealing energy away. So as, as these charges flow through the resistor, they had a lot of electrical potential energy. Now they have very little. That energy went somewhere. If this is a resistor, it just turns into heat. If it's a light bulb, it turns into light. It is stealing energy somehow and it's resisting. So this is a resistor because it resists 
the flow of current resistor. And it has a resistance R, and the bigger this resistance, the more it resists the flow of current. Um, what does this physically depend on, this resistance R? Uh, well, it depends on what the material is made out of. That's the resistivity. So this row is the resistivity. This is like a, a measure of an object's just natural inherent resistiveness to current flow. So glass has much more re higher has much higher resistivity than gold, and uh, you know so insulators have a very high resistivity. Conductors have a very low resistivity, but that's not the only thing it depends on. If you said, hey, which, what has more resistance, um, plastic or gold? You know, a lot of people wouldn't be, would want to say, oh, plastic, obviously, because it's an insulator. But what if I told you I'm going to make my gold wire 80 light years long? <laughs> well, if the length is really long, you also get a big resistance. So theoretically, you could make a a wire out of gold that has more resistance, this is the resistance, has more resistance than a wire made out of like plastic if the length of that wire is, you know, the length of the universe or something like that. So the longer the resistor, the more resistance there is to it. You can think about it like this. If you've got some cylindrical resistor here, think about it like a traffic jam. If you've got a traffic jam four miles long, it's going to it's going to really back up the flow of traffic here. If the traffic jams only like last for like 20 feet, then you're not going to back up the flow of traffic. Traffic being the current here is going to flow much easier. So resistance is resistivity times the length of the resistor. That's this divided by the area of the resistor. Now, the area isn't the entire area. We're talking about the cross-sectional area here. The bigger that area, the easier it is for traffic to flow. Kind of makes sense. If you look at this like a tube, the bigger this area here, the easier it will be for like water to flow through. You'd expect less resistance. So this is what resistance physically depends on. And then the way these three quantities are related, I got three quantities here. I got current, I've got voltage, I've got resistance. The way they're related is with Ohm's law. This is the most basic formula in all of you know, electric physics, it's that the amount of current you're going to get, whoops, the amount of current you will get through a wire, it's going to equal, um, well, I should say, the amount of current you'll get through some resistor is going to equal the amount of voltage across that resistor. I should color code this. The amount of current you get through a resistor is going to equal the amount of voltage across that resistor divided by the resistance of that resistor. This is called Ohm's law. And Ohm came up with a lot of this. The unit of resistance is ohms. Uh, the unit of voltage, not surprisingly, is volts. And the unit, current, the unit of current is amps. So amps, you could tell its charge per time is just coulombs per second. So Ohm's law tells us how current, voltage, and resistance are related. Now, to be honest, it's really just the definition of resistance. If I flip this over, if I say resistance is delta V over I, I mean, Ohm's law is a definition of what we mean by resistance. If you're like, hey, what does resistance mean? What's the definition? This is the definition of resistance. You apply some voltage to something. You measure how much current flows through it. Uh, that ratio gives you the, the resistance by definition. Uh, so it's kind of circular. Like, what do we mean by resistance? This thing. <laughs> now, this is what resistance physically depends on. These two equations are different. This is the definition of resistance. Ohm's law is the definition of resistance. But, you know, this replay formula R equals rho L over A. This is what uh, resistance whoa, physically, physically depends on. And so that's the difference here. It's, it's the same analogy between, you know, the definition of, the definition of acceleration is delta V over delta T. You can't prove that formula wrong. I can't be like, go out and do an experiment that proves whether acceleration is delta V over delta T because that's just 
by definition of what we mean by acceleration. I mean, you could use the, the derivative version if you wanted. But again, definition. That's the definition of acceleration. What acceleration physically depends on is, you know, net force over mass. This isn't really the definition of acceleration. This is how acceleration depends on other physical factors. This is how resistance depends on other physical factors. And this is what the definition of resistance is. All right, so that's current, that's voltage, that's resistance, that's resistivity. Uh, power, so the amount of power used by a resistor, you know, this thing's going to be converting a certain amount of electrical potential energy per second, depending on what it is. And so power is still defined to be the energy per time. So it's how much energy something uses up or transfers or transports per time. You could think about it like the work being done per time. Um, and if you wanted to get all calculus definition here, you could imagine an infinitesimal amount of energy being transformed in an infinitesimal amount of time. So this has units of joules per second. And what is the unit of power? <laughs> my favorite dad joke of all time. What is the unit of power that is correct? What is the unit of power? I try not to dad joke, but that thing, I don't know. It never gets old. It really does not get old or something wrong with me. All right, power is this quantity. How does this? So this, this has nothing to do with, keep in mind, this has nothing to do with circuits yet. This is all just based on, you know, pre-circuit electric. There's nothing electric up here. The way you relate it to circuits is that for a resistor, the amount of power that something's going to use is, well, how much voltage there is across it multiplied by how much current flows through it. So if I take the voltage across a circuit element and I multiply by how much current is running through it, I get the power used by that circuit element. So this P here for circuits, the power used by a resistor is going to be the current that flows through a resistor. So the power used by a resistor is current that flows through the resistor times the voltage across that resistor. And you might be like, well, that's just, just pulled that out of nowhere. Where, where does this come from? Let's just see. Let's check this out. Power is I and I is dQ dt, and then, you know, delta V is delta V. Okay, pretty good, pretty good. What if we multiplied dQ by the delta V? Now, maybe you remember, FIVU check, FIVU being, you know, force, electric field, electric potential, electric potential energy. If you remember how electric potential V and electric potential energy are related, uh, U is Q times V. So look at what we got here. We got DQ times delta V. Well, I can rewrite it this way. Delta U would equal Q delta V. So I've got a little bit of charge multiplied by a voltage drop that gives me a little bit of potential energy change. And so what I have over here, power equals this whole thing right here, DQ times delta V is a little bit of charge times this. That gives me a differential amount of change in energy divided by dt. Well, look at what we got, du dt. That's de dt. That's the differential change in energy over time. That's what we mean by power. So that's why this, this seemingly rando current times delta v really is just the definition of power. That's how much energy, how many watts of energy your light bulb or microwave or whatever is turning into turning energy from these electrons that are losing potential energy, how fast it's converting that energy into something else. Now, we draw current going this way. It's really it's really electrons going the other way. This is the dirty little secret in electronics is that it's really electrons flowing this way, but the idea is still the same. The electrons are going to be losing energy. They travel toward higher potential to get toward lower potential energy just because of that negative sign, but it's not worth worrying about too much. You can pretend like current comes out of the positive end of this battery and get away with your life just fine. So that's power. Now, if I don't like this formula for power, I just don't. Because like I is a variable that changes a lot. Delta V is a variable that changes a lot. I like 
this version a lot better. Look at, we know current is delta V over R. So just take what current is, delta V over R, and plug it into the R, and you'll get delta V over R times delta V, because I is just delta V over R, and that gives you the voltage squared over the resistance. So if you take the voltage squared across some resistor, and you divide by the resistance of that resistor, it gives you the power used by that resistor. Why is this formula any better? I mean, it's not, it's equivalent mathematically, so a robot wouldn't care, but personally, I like it because like the resistance of a resistor doesn't really change, it's just like whatever it is. So maybe this resistor is like 100 ohms. And if I crank up the battery, it just stays 100 ohms. So like in an AP Physics E problem, they might be like, what if we double the this or that or the other thing? Well, resistance pretty much stays the same. That's not completely true. That's only true if you have an ohmic material. But if they call something a resistor, they mean that it's ohmic. Ohmic means constant resistance no matter what the current is through it. Technically, as things heat up, they could change their resistance a little bit. But unless it says otherwise, you're just going to pretend like this resistance stays constant, which is why this formula is cool, because like, all right, double the voltage, well, shoot, this resistance stays constant. You know, so that's something I just have to hold on to here while all else is going crazy. This stays constant. But if I double the voltage, I might get more current or something, and so both of these change, whereas in this formula, only the delta V would be changing theoretically, and the R would stay the same. So I like this version better, but I like this version the absolute best. Instead of getting rid of I, I like getting rid of delta V. So delta V is I times R. So if I plug that in over there, I'd get I times delta V. Delta V is I times R. So I'd have I, I, R, which is dumb looking. So we write it like I squared R. Again, this version is just a little nicer because, yeah, maybe the current changes through your resistor, but your resistance isn't going to change if it's ohmic, like most resistors in that that therefore, oops, therefore this power formula right here is nice because, you know, more current through a resistor, you get more power. More voltage across the resistor, you have more power, all else being equal. If R is the same, uh, then you just have one variable to worry about that might be changing if you start cranking up the battery or something like that. Okay, so that's power. Um... What would you ever do with a power formula? Like theoretically, uh, the AP problem could ask you about, oh man, my screen froze. There we go, it's back. Gotta get a new Mac. These Macs are getting old, man. <laughs> PC, I'm gonna join the PC club in a minute here. Uh, power is the energy per time. So let's say you bothered to figure this number out. You're like, oh, it's 100 watts, because watts are the unit of power. You could then set that equal to the amount of energy per time, you know, energy per time. Let's say that power was constant. And then you can multiply by your time to get how much energy was transferred in a given amount of time. Or if you write this as DEDT, if you really want to get fancy, maybe this is not 100 watts. Maybe this is some function of time. You know, you could throw DT over here and you'd get that DE is the integral, or sorry, integral DE is integral of whatever your power was as a function of time times dt, and then you can get what the energy was in some time zero to what, I don't know, 300 seconds or something like that. So power lets you find how much energy gets used in a certain amount of time, if you're into that kind of thing. All right, so the next thing is Kirchhoff's or Kirchhoff's rules. These are important because, let me just show you here, if I draw a rando circuit, you know, I don't have to draw a rando circuit. Look at this one here. Uh, this is the 2019 AP Physics C electricity and magnetism problem. Let me give full credit where credit is due here. I'm about to bring this thing. Oops, nope, nope, nope. About to bring this thing down right here. 2019 AP Physics C. Um, there's two batteries. There's three resistors. There's all kinds of stuff going on here. This might have been a nightmare for kids. They were sitting down like, what? Two batteries, suck a, what do I look like? <laughs> Best Buy up in here? I don't have, I don't know how to deal with two batteries because you might think, well, all right, um, let's find, look at, look at this number two. Let's find the current in the 200 ohm resistor. So you might think, okay, 
no problemo. Current through the 200 ohm resistor, I got Ohm's law, right? So I'm going to say that um, I'm going to say that I equals delta V over R. Ohm's law. Delta V is, and then you're like, oh boy, is it six? Is it zero? Is it like 12 or something? Oh, maybe we'll go 12 or something. 12 volts over 200 ohms. Well, this isn't right. This isn't right because I got three resistors in here. No one of these resistors gets 12 full volts. And I know that by looking at it, and I know it because of Kirchhoff's rules. So when you use Ohm's law, uh, which is this here, when you use Ohm's law, you need to be specific. This all has to be personalized to one specific resistor. So the current through the 200 ohm resistor has to equal the voltage across the 200 ohm resistor divided by 200 ohms. But I just plugged in some rando 12 volts here. So 12 volts is not the voltage across this 200 ohm resistor. Six volts isn't even the voltage across the 200 ohm resistor. What do you do? Well, you have to use Kirchhoff's rules. So that's what we're gonna do right here. So. Kirchhoff's rules is a way to figure out well, what is the voltage across an individual resistor if you got some complicated circuit. So what, you know, Kirchhoff has two rules. Uh, the first one is the junction rule. It says that the total current flowing into a junction had better equal the total current flowing out of a junction. This just says, you know, if you've got a, a scenario right here, check this out. So if you have I1, I1 comes in here, I1 goes right out of there. There's just as much current coming out of the 150 ohm as there is going into. So remember, if you make an analogy to a roller coaster here, charges like people on the roller coaster, just because they fell, they lost potential energy as they went through this drop. So the resistor is a drop in the roller coaster. You know, you lose potential energy, but you do not lose people on the drop of the roller coaster. So I1 is the same on this side as it is on that side. There was no loss in charge. There was no loss in current. There's no loss in people on a roller coaster. All they lost was potential energy. So that's I1. You've got I3 coming up here. And again, I3 coming in, flows into here. There's just as much current I3 flowing out of this 100 ohm as there was flowing into it. But I2 is gonna be different. Check this out. Both of these current flow up. They flow up and then they flow straight down to here. So I2 is gonna be big. So this is a junction. A junction is a point on a wire where, or a point in a circuit where where three or more wires join up. So this, not a junction. That is not a junction, that's just a corner of a wire. This is a junction, three wires come together. So if you had three or more wires coming together, that is a junction. And this is the junction rule. So what the junction rule says for this circuit is that the total current flowing in, which would be I1 plus I3. So I1 plus I3, has to add up to the total current flowing out of this junction, which was just I2. That's what Kirchhoff's junction rule says. That's the junction rule. It's just, it's really just based on conservation of charge. You can't create or destroy charge. It's gotta go somewhere. And so it's just, whatever flows in has gotta flow out. So that's a junction rule. That's the first Kirchhoff rule. The second Kirchhoff rule is the loop rule. And the loop rule says that if you add up all the changes in V, all the voltage drops around some closed loop. They have all got to add up to zero. So you can rise in V, you can drop in V, but if you go around a closed loop, it's got to all add up to zero. And this is called the loop rule. And it's called that because you have to go around a full loop. So let's try that. So I'm going to start in this corner right here. And I'm going to go around in this loop right here. There, 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 back to there. It's got to be a complete loop. That's a possible loop. So if I go around that way, around that loop right there, I add up all the changes in V. So what am I going to get? I'm going to, I'm going to rise six volts. So that's plus six. If you go through a battery from the negative terminal, the, the little side, you know, the short end to the, the longer end, the longer end is always the positive end. If you choose your loop such that you go from the shorter end to the positive end, you rise up six volts. This is like a roller coaster. This is the part that carries you up at the very beginning. You're on that roller coaster and it's like tick, 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 and it lifts you up all the way to the top. Now you've got a lot of potential energy up here. Well, I went through a resistor, that's a drop. All these resistors will be drops if you go with the current. So if you follow the flow of the current, you're gonna be dropping there. 
It's just like if you rode on the roller coaster, you'll be dropping on that drop right there. Um, how much will you drop? Well, we can use Ohm's law. I don't know the current here, but I could just call it I1. So you're gonna drop, so this is gonna be minus. You will drop a certain amount. You'll drop I1, whatever that current is, so I'm just gonna leave it as a variable, times 150, because remember, Ohm's law says that delta V equals IR. So I'm taking the current times the resistance, that gives me the voltage drop across that resistor. So I gotta multiply by 150 ohms. And I keep going, I'm not done yet. Now I go through here, I drop through the 200 ohm resistor too, but there's a different current through there. So it's I2. I2 is the current that flows through the 200 ohm. So it's voltage drop. Remember, this ohm's law has to be tailored to a specific resistor. So I'm trying to, if I'm trying to find the voltage drop across the 200 ohm resistor, I need to take the current through the 200 ohm resistor. So I2 is the current that flows through the 200 ohm resistor, and I multiply by 200 ohms. Now I'm done, I get back to the beginning. You might be like, no, no, you hit a junction, but junctions don't change your voltage. Current changes at a junction. That's what the junction rule says. Voltage only changes because you go through a battery or a resistor or something like that, like a circuit element, like capacitors or anything like that. But a junction does not change your voltage or it doesn't change the electric potential. So you get back to the beginning, you set the whole thing equal to zero. Now, this is how I knew the voltage drop across the 200 couldn't have been like 12 volts or something like that. Because look, plus six, oops, plus six, minus something, minus something. Okay, neither of these can be like 12 because if you subtract 12 here, and then subtract more, you can never get this whole thing to add up to zero. These two drops together will have to add up to something that that cancels six. So I'm not gonna have 12 volts here, I'm not gonna have six. If the drop across the 200 was six, that'd mean there's zero current flowing through the 150 ohm resistor, but that makes no sense. There's gonna be current flowing through here. So, so that's what the loop rule says. It says that this is true, this whole uh, summation is zero, but you might be like, okay, so how do we do this? Let's see, using Kirchhoff's rules, write, but do not solve equations that can be used to solve for the current in each resistor. So this would be one equation, but I got two unknowns. I don't know I1 and I don't know I2. You might be like, oh, that's okay, because check it out, we got the loop rule. That says this is true. And it's like, yeah, but this has got three unknowns. <laughs> Like, okay, well, we need another formula then. Like, if we got three unknowns, we need three equations. So we could do one more loop rule. Um, we could do, oh, you know what? Okay, we can get clever here. We could do this one here. I'm going to start at this point right here. Again, I'm going to come around this. Oh, that's a square. I'm going to come around this way right here. I'm going to go all the way around and all the way around the outside loop. And there's a reason, I'll show you why I'm doing this in a second. If I do this, I can make a pretty simple formula. So again, adding up all the delta Vs. I go through this battery, again I get plus six. Plus six volts. I go through the 150, and you're like, we already did this, it's I1 times 150 ohms. Okay, fine. I go through the 100, and I get, uh, okay, this time, look at, I'm going against the current. So this is like if you were to walk uphill on one of these ramps, say you're a repairman. Think about this loop rule as you're the repairman, you don't have to go the direction the ride's supposed to go. You could walk in whatever direction you want. So if you're on the ride, you'd be like, wee, you fall, fall, you go this way. Or if you're on this track, whoa, and you fall that way. If you're the repairman, you shut the ride down, you walk wherever you want. And if you walk wherever you want, you can walk down the drop and then you can walk up the drop. So if you go against the current, if your loop has been chosen, because you chose it, to go against the direction of the current in any particular section, then if you go through a resistor in that section, you're, you're actually walking up the drop of the roller coaster because current flows downhill. So delta V in this from this point to that point isn't gonna be negative, it's actually gonna be positive what do we call this, I3? So that's I3 over there. It's gonna be positive I3 times 100 ohms. 
And I've got one more battery to go through, but this time I'm going through the wrong way. Look at I'm going through the battery from the positive terminal. Let me draw this better. From the positive terminal to the negative terminal. So not only did I walk up this drop, I'm walking down this beginning part of a roller coaster that normally lifts you up. So I'm walking down and I'm going from the positive end to the negative end. If you ever go from the positive to negative end, you're actually subtracting that. So that's negative 6V. And now I'm all the way back to where I started. You pass through a junction, doesn't matter for the loop rule. No changes in V happen at a junction. That whole thing equals zero. The reason I wanted to choose this is because look what happens. My 6V here just cancels my 6V there and I end up with something kind of easy. I just get that I3, this is kind of nice, I3 times 100 ohms has got to equal I1. I1 times 150 ohms. I still got two unknowns here. <laughs> So, I mean, it's a system of equations at this point. So we've, we've done part I. We used Kirchhoff's rules and we wrote and did not solve the equations that could be used to solve for the current in each resistor. So I got one, I got two, I got three equations that could be solved. You know, I got three unknowns, I1, I2, I3. And I got three equations for them. You could solve these in order to get the current through one of the resistors, which I suppose is what we're doing in, in part double I. So in double I, we're supposed to actually find the current through this 200 ohm resistor. Um, you know, we could just solve here. There is one more loop we could try. You know, on the AP, you wouldn't want to be wasting a lot of time. But for the sake of just, you know, pedagogy and teaching you how to do these things, Let's say I started here and went this way. This is the last loop. The last loop says, I'll just put it over here. This is like the extra one. You'd get six volts, positive six. Uh, we went through the 100 and we're going with the current. So minus I3, I should color code this. Minus I3 times 100 ohms. And we went through a junction, that doesn't matter. But then we went through this 200 ohm, and so we are dropping because we're going with the current. We're going the same direction as the current. So minus I2 times 200 ohms, and that whole thing has to add up to zero because we're back to the beginning. So you got, you really have four equations. I mean, use whichever three of these you want. This is an extra one. Uh, I mean, there's different ways to solve a system of equations. I for me, I'm like simple, I'm a simple man. I like just substituting into the formula to get what it is. So first thing, I'm gonna simplify this one here. Uh, I'm gonna say that this is I3. It's just gonna equal, what is it? 150 over 100, well, that's just 1.5. So I3 just equals 1.5 times I1. That's great. That is some simple stuff right there. So if I took this and I plugged it into, ah, sure, let's just plug it into here. Like I could plug it into there and get rid of I3. So if I do that, I get I1 plus 1.5 I1. So that's just gonna be, you know, was that 2.5? 2.5 I1, let me make sure. I1 plus one and a half I1s. So one I1 plus one and a, half I1s is two and a half I1s. And that equals, I'm not great at math, I'm good at physics, not good at math, equals I2. Well, beautiful, that's pretty freaking simple. Now I've got what I2 is. Uh, what's the most simple thing to do here? I guess, hmm, okay, I can get rid of, uh, let's see, what are my formulas? I got this one here. I can get rid of I2 in here. So I could plug in what I2 is right there. And I'm gonna move this formula here down here. So after I plug in, I get 6V minus, what is it, 150? I'm just gonna write it as 150. I'm gonna leave off the unit here, ohm. 150 ohms times I1 minus 200 
200 ohms times I2, but I2 is just 2.5 I1. 2.5 I1. That whole thing's going to add up to zero because that's what the loop rule said. And now I've just got, you know, one variable here, I1. So we'd have six volts. And I got uh, 2.5 times 200 is 500. Is that right? I think so. 500. <laughs> uh, yes, that's right. 500. And I got 150. So that's minus 650 I1. That whole thing equals zero. And that means that I1, I through one is just going to equal six over 650 amps. So that's my current through I1. You might be like, uh, cool, that's cool and all, but that's not what the question asked for. They asked for the current in I2. Well, that's not that bad now. Look, I want I2, I come up here. I2 just equals 2.5 times the current in I1. So 2.5 times six is 15. So, whoa, those are squares. 15 over 650. Uh, amps is the current through I2. That'd be the current through the 200. And if you wanted the current through the 100, I3, we had that over here. I could get that if I wanted. Uh, I3 is going to equal 1.5 times I1. So I1 was this. So this is going to equal 9 over 650 amps. And you can kind of see if things start making sense here. I3 plus I1, we're supposed to add up to I2. So I3 plus I1, 9650 or 650ths plus 6 650ths does equal 15 650ths. I mean, but that's no surprise because we use this formula to get it. Um, I mean, we could just check. This was 2019. Let's see. Uh, problem 2, double I. Problem two, double I, 2019 answers. Uh, and the answer is 0 0.023, which is 15 650ths. Excellent, did it. So the junction rule and the loop rule can allow you to figure it out. Basically the current and voltage across any element, even if you got multiple batteries in there, uh, you can figure these things out. So your Homework, uh, I mean, okay, let's do one more, sorry. One more, power. What's the power dissipated by the 200 ohm resistor? Okay, now that you know the current, you can say that, remember, one formula for power was I squared R. So the power would be like, you know, whatever the I was through there was 15, 650 ths I know that's not reduced, squared times the R is 200. And that would be how many watts of power the 200 is dissipating in heat or whatever it is like that. Um, other things you could solve for, it could be like, what's the voltage? Remember in the beginning, I was like, hey, you can't say the voltage across the 200 is 6 or 12. Let's figure out what it is. Voltage across the 200, now we could do Ohm's Law, is the current through the 200, which is 15 six fiftieths amps times the resistance is 200 uh, so what does this come out to be? This would be like 3,000 over 650. I'm going to use my calculator here. 3,000 over 650 is 4.62, I guess. So yeah, 4.62 volts is the volts across the 200 ohm resistor. But you wouldn't have known this from the get-go. I'm not going to look at this circuit and be like, oh, yeah, obviously 4.62 here. You have to do some junction rule. You have to do some loop rule, and that can let you get to the answer.